it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first talk of this semester of the History Department Seminar Series. Um, it is a pleasure to welcome Professor Anissa Mohani to Queen's University, located in the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Mauritian people, in reminding us in her work of the unsettling uses of indigeneity upon which the South Asian immigrants' claims to land in Canada came to rest in the early part of the 20th century. Professor Mawani helps me think through what it means for me, an immigrant from South Asia, to acknowledge my own place in this history and territory as I welcome you know, here today. This relationship between terms such as, such as native, indigenous, settler, immigrant, that we sometimes take for granted is but one of the many things that Professor Mawani helps us unsettle, rethink, and re-theorize in her excellent body of work. Uh, Professor Mawani's first book, Colonial Proximities, which was published in 2009, details of legal encounters between Aboriginal peoples, Chinese migrants, Europeans, and those enumerated as mixed race populations along Canada's west coast. Her second book, Across Oceans of Law, upon which today's uh, talk draws, and which has been enjoyed by several graduate students who are now in this room. Uh, is based, um, um, consolidates the Pacific, uh, the Indian, and Atlantic Oceans into a single analytical frame, explores the entanglements between transatlantic slavery, indigenous dispossession, Indian indenture, and free migration, and delineates what Professor Mawani evocatively terms uh, oceans as a method. The book has just been shortlisted for uh, the Socio-Legal Studies Associate, Association Theory and History Prize, and uh, good luck with that. Uh, last year, she also published a co-edited volume, Unmooring the Komagata Maru, Changing Colonial Trajectories. She's also editing with Antoinette Burton, um, a volume entitled Animalia, an anti-imperial police theory for our times, which is to be published later this year. Um, I could go on about her many accomplishments. She has uh, numerous uh, edited journal issues, book chapters, and articles uh, that many of us have read and enjoyed and learned from. Uh, from. Uh, and but I think it's best if I turn uh, this over to Professor Malwani, uh, who's speaking today about her book, Across Oceans of Law, The Kumagata Maru, and Jerusalem <coughs> in the Time of Empire. Please join me in welcome. and for the introduction and thank you all for uh, coming and um, um, for listening. Um, so my talk today is uh, draws from my recent book, Across Oceans of Law, um, The Komagach Maru and Jurisdiction in the Time of Empire. And sorry, can you hear me in the back? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so the book retells the voyage of the Komagata Maru by shifting it from a story about immigration or a story about Canada's dark mm -hmm. moment in history to a global maritime legal history. And in the book, I suggest that oceans might be a way to think about uh, how law, history, and colonialism, uh, uh, or how law, history, and colonialism sort of manifest across time and space. Um, and I'm happy to say more about this in the Q&A. Um, so, the vessel was chartered by Baba Gurdit Singh, a railway contractor and rubber planter from Malaya. Um, he chartered the vessel on March, in March 1914. It left Hong Kong on April 4th and arrived in Vancouver Harbor on May 23rd, carrying 376 migrants from Punjab. Most were Sikhs, some were Hindus, and approximately 25 were Muslim. And after a three-week journey, at sea and two months detention aboard the vessel, only 20 people were allowed to land. The remaining 356 passengers were denied entry under three orders in council, including the continuous journey regulation which required all arrivals to Canada to make a direct voyage from their place of birth or naturalization. So here is the uh, incoming and outgoing voyage of the ship. By 1914, the Dominion government pressured steamship companies not to bring passengers from India. A direct route was impossible as ships had to stop to refuel along the way. 
after an immigration hearing and a ruling by the BC Court of Appeal, the 356 passengers aboard the ship were deported to Calcutta. Many had been living abroad uh, in uh, port cities in China, Japan, and in Manila. Um, some had not been back to India for decades. So Gurdjit Singh, for example, had been living outside of India for uh, many years. And many of them didn't even want to go back uh, because they didn't have uh, employment prospects and were hoping to go back to Hong Kong where they boarded. Thanks to the work of scholars, artists, and activists in Canada, the US, India, and more recently Japan, the Komagata Maru's voyage has now become iconic, inspiring new scholarship and creative practice, including theater productions, visual art, and poetry. And of course, in May 2016, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau apologized to Canada's South Asian communities for deporting the vessel, and that also has generated interest and uh, criticism around the ship. So the scholarship on the Komagatamuru is now voluminous and expanding, but what I argue in the book is that the ship's journey has largely been narrated through uh, the coordinates of arrival, departure, nationalism, and territoriality, themes that have foregrounded and emphasized histories of immigration. And yet, when we see this map, we see that the ship crossed the Pacific and Indian Oceans, um, the passengers spent six months at sea, confined to a vessel that was crowded and filthy. So many complained of overflowing toilets, of rats and flies, and a lack of provisions. And if you see some of the, um, the uh, photographs of the Komodachimuru, you see how closely compressed these people are on um, you know, a relatively small ship. Yet few have considered the ship as a legal actor or as a character in the story. Few have considered the ship's transoceanic roots and the colonial histories its movements engendered and recalled. So Across Oceans of Law, as the book's title suggests, situates the Komagatamaru's journey within oceans and maritime worlds. My move from land to sea, from immigration law to maritime regulations, is an effort to track the movements of law and Indian radicalism and to invite other ways of writing global legal history. By following a single ship through time and space, I trace its actual roots along the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the connections it forged with the Atlantic, and the legal and political effects in, and its legal and political effects in the British Empire and beyond. When viewed from the sea, the Komagatamaru's journey appears as much more than a national immigration history. It becomes a global event that joined Indian migration to other histories of British imperial rule. So the book thinks with oceans and seas as an interconnected whole and approaches, in doing so, approaches the territorial dispossession of indigenous people, transatlantic slavery, Chinese Indian indenture, and so-called free migration as overlapping forms of racial and colonial violence that were also joined together through shared legal forms. And so part of what I'm interested in tracing is how these, uh, um, how these forms of racial and colonial violence are actually joined through legal forms themselves. And some of this will become clear, I hope, in my talk today. So my talk is gonna focus on the Atlantic Ocean, an ocean that the Komodatamaru never crossed in its 1914 voyage, but which loomed large nonetheless. In the second chapter of the book, I trace the links between transatlantic slavery and Indian migration in a number of ways, through the legal personhood of the ship, the legal personhood of the slave, through maritime economies, and in the anti-colonial critiques made by Gurdjit Singh and passengers aboard. During the Kamagatamaru's uh, journey, Passengers drew on history of transatlantic slavery to challenge what they believed to be the inhumanity of British law. Maritime worlds, I argue more fully in the book, help to foreground connections across time and space, connections that may be un unforeseen, unexpected, and overlooked, especially when Indian migration is studied from land alone. And this map shows the voyages um, of the Steubenhof from 1890 to 1894, the Sicilia, which the ship was initially it was then named from 1894 to 1896, and then the Komagatamaru from 1913 to 1917. And as I was thinking of a sort of conceptual frame of, uh, for the book, this map became really central. So these are all uh, voyages that I plotted from the Lloyd's Weekly Shipping Index. 
And what it really demonstrated was that was the kinds of the ways in which the movement of ships, not just this one, actually connected um, ocean regions and port cities. And so this was something that I was trying to think with um, analytically in the book. So before I, in, I turn to uh, the Atlantic to slavery and to the legal personhood of the ship, I want to make a brief detour that introduces the Komagatamaru as a legal agent and a protagonist in the voyage. So in 1890, Charles Connell and Company, a mid-sized family firm located on Glasgow's Clyde River, built the vessel. Initially named the Steubenhook, the passenger cargo ship was commissioned by the German, German Hansa Line to transport Europeans from Hamburg to Antwerp across the Atlantic to Montreal. The ship also carried Canadian cattle from Montreal to British ports, including Thames and Dundee. And uh, the Hansa Line frequently advertised uh, the cattle transporting capacities of the ship. In 1892, the vessel was sold to the Hamburg America Line, and two years later, it was named the Cecilia. Under its new owners, the steamship continued to collect passengers from Hamburg, other German ports, but also included northern European cities. For the next decade, the Hamburg America Line expanded its routes to include southern Europe and the Mediterranean, and passengers aboard the Sicilia came from port cities in Italy, Greece, Algeria, Spain, Turkey, and took passage to Montreal, Boston, New Orleans, Ellis Island, uh, landing in many of the same ports as the, slave, as the slave ships that preceded it. Ships, as we know, were vital to Europe's empires, including their racial, political, and economic dominance of the globe. And this particular ship demonstrates some of these relations on a micro scale. So under its different owners and names, the Steubenhook and Cecilia were directly implicated in the dispossession of indigenous people in North America and in the resettlement of their lands. Connell's ships, including this one, transported labor and commodities. So some of Connell's ships transported Indian indentures. Others, including the Komagatamaru, uh, transported cattle and coal, and some transported sugar. Uh, many transported settlers. So between 1894 and 1913, the Sicilia made 62 trips to Ellis Island. Moving over 40,000 people from the so-called old world to the new, and thus actively participating in the deterritorialization de of the Algonquin-speaking Lenape's people from their ancestral land. So although not all of these, pe all of these settlers actually stayed in uh, North America, it did still create a kind of trajectory of movement. In 1913, the ship was sold to a small Japanese firm and renamed the Komukatamaru, uh, which was very poorly highlight, highlighted there in green, um, and after the Asakusa <coughs> district in Tokyo. And due to a translation error, the ship would be called the Komukatamaru and listed as such in uh, the Lloyd's Registry, and it's highlighted in green at the very bottom. Although there was no formal uh, name change, uh, this became the name of the ship. And in 1924, the vessel was sold for the last time and renamed the Hain Maru and was shipwrecked off the coast of Hokkaido in 1925. So when we think of oceans, law is not often the first thing that comes to mind. In some ways, the title of the book, Across Oceans of Law, may seem somewhat curious. But the sea does have a legal history that I can only briefly gesture to here. From the 17th century, the sea was viewed as vast, empty, and out of bounds. Oceans, especially the high seas, were beyond the borders and claims of empire states. The sea was a space, but what, not one that could be owned or occupied. So for Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius, who is best known for his treatise on the free sea, oceans were immense and infinite. They manifested an ethereal quality that rendered them to be closer to air than to land. Although Grotius famously declared the sea to be free, this freedom, I argue in the book, was a freedom of European commerce and not a freedom from law. So in his 1609 book, Mere Liberum, or Free Sea, Grotius recognized that the movements of European ships produced multiple and competing jurisdictional claims. The sea could not be owned, he insisted, but it could be dominated through the maritime presence of imperial powers. And of course, the, um, the sort of conflict that he has in mind is between the Dutch and the Portuguese in the eastern um, Indian Ocean region. 
See, had long been the site of legal orders through international treaties and agreements. But for Grotius, the, movements, the movement of ships was part of a broader maritime legal order. Um, ships played a dual role. So, he's, so basically, he's arguing that moving ships uh, were part of a law of the sea. Um, ships played a dual role as so sources of order in the oceans, world historian Lauren Benton reminds us. They were islands of law with their own regulations and judicial personnel, the captain, for example, um, and these judicial personnel acted as representatives of municipal legal authorities. Although Benton is a legal historian of the early Atlantic, she doesn't consider how transatlantic slavery was implicated and even foundational to the law of the ship and the law of the sea. And this is where my argument sort of uh, intervenes. Legal histories of the sea and of maritime mobility, including so-called Indian migration, are deeply connected to histories of transatlantic slavery. So basically what I'm arguing is that one can't actually write a legal history of the sea or think of a legal history of the sea without engaging with transatlantic slavery. The legal status of the ship, for example, offered a legal form that shaped the legal status of the slave and vice versa. So by now, some of you may have questions, what could transatlantic slavery a trade formally abolished by British and American jurists in 1808 and abolished in the British colonies in 1834 have to do with the Japanese merchant ship that crossed the Pacific and Indian Oceans in 1914 with 376 Punjabi migrants on board? Long after abolition, histories of slavery continued to shape maritime worlds and establish sea routes and itineraries through the status of ships as legal persons, in the legal regulation of Indian indentures of free Indian migrants, and in the violence of the Middle Passage. And the echoes of slavery are palpable in the Kamadatamaru's voyage. So in the remainder of my time, I want to turn first to the legal status of the ship and its relation to the legal status of the slave and then to the Komagatamaru's journey and how the ghosts of transatlantic slavery informed Indian anti-coloniality. So in British and Anglo maritime cultures, ships have long been regarded as persons and legal persons respectively. For seafarers, ships were never inanimate objects, they were living and willful beings. It was common for captains and crews to describe their vessels as having ship sounds, an intuition through which ships could know and navigate the seas. According to one source, it was seriously believed that an old western ocean traveler could find her way from the Mersey River in Liverpool to her own pier in New York without a man's help. And this was all through ship sense. So a ship sense, many captains and sailors claimed, was enhanced or inhibited by temperament and personality. Vessels had husbands and sisters. They were made lively through heteronormative and familial relations. And the Steuben Hook was uh, ship 168. Its sister ship was, six, was ship 167, known as the Grim. Ships were animated by customs of the sea, but it was through the British common law and British and U.S. admiralty law that they were afforded a legal status. In Britain and the U.S., a ship was only a ship when its, full was, when its hull was fully complete. So this would not be a ship. A ship within the meaning of admiralty is anything which is intended for navigation, one source explained. A boat in an unfinished condition or one wholly unfit for navigation is not a ship within the meaning of admiralty. From, 18, from 1818 onwards, the definition of a ship was debated by the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1902, Justice Brown uh, explicitly defined the ship as follows. A ship is born when she is launched and lives so long as her identity is preserved. Prior to her launching, she is a mere congeries of wood and iron an ordinary piece of personal property, as distinctly a land structure as a house. So by anthropomorphizing the ship as a feminine figure, Brown signaled two key moments in her metamorphosis. The first was the baptism, or the launching, in which a ship receives her name. The second was the moment her keel touches the water. As the vessel was la launched downriver, she was magically transformed into an inanimate thing into a subject of admiralty jurisdiction. A ship legally defined acquires a personality of her own, just as Brown reason, she becomes competent to contract and is individually liable for her obligations upon which she may sue in the name of her owners and be sued in her own name. 
The legal life that American jurists ascribe to ships marked an extension of British admiralty law and of maritime customs. But as vessel personification became a legal fiction in the 19th and early 20th century uh, in the US, its status as legal person declined in Britain. But the anthropomorphized ship retained its continuity with British legal thought through the law of Diodand, a, le a legal concept that was derived from the common law and provided shape both to the ship and the slave as legal person. So under the British common law of Diodand, a ship was viewed as a legal person. Derived from the Latin diodandum, meaning that which must be given to God, a diodand was any chattel property that caused the death of an adult human. It was deemed to be an accursed thing that was to be forfeited to God, whose earthly representative was the sovereign. So under the common law, inanimate and animate non-human entities such as animals, knives, carts, locomotives, and ships were given a legal life that could be taken away by the crown. Non-human animals and objects could be arrested, condemned, and forced to forfeiture. As the 19th century progressed and with the growing power exercised by railroad companies, Diodan was described to be the remnant of a barbarous and absurd law that was unreasonable and inconvenient in the current age. It was abolished in 1846. But the abolition of Diodan, like the abolition of slavery, did not mark its demise or disappearance. In admiralty law, Diodan persisted as a recurring legal forum that shifted between human and non-human and connected ship to slave, all in the interests of maritime commerce, in an effort to extend Anglo legal jurisdiction across the sea. So the law of Diodan was never formally adopted in Britain's colonies, yet many of its fiercest critics were American commentators. So in a 1906 article published in the San Francisco Call, Diodan was described to American readers as an ancient English law. The article turned to William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England and described Diodan as follows. Any personal chattel that is the immediate occasion of the death of any reasonable creature, and this is from Blackstone, is to be forfeited to the king to be applied to pious uses and distributed in alms by his high almanac. The Diodan was in many ways a repetition of biblical laws. The Diodan removed legal liability from the owner and placed it in the thing or the animal. The proprietor remained responsible for actions of his chattel and was punished through forfeiture. The cost of Diodan was not determined by the worth of life lost, but by the value of the particular object that caused the death, be it a sword, an ox, or a slave. As a provision of the common law, Diodan held no jurisdiction on the sea. According to Blackstone, ships could be Diodan, but only under specific conditions. So he said, no Diodans are due for accidental happening on the high seas, as these are beyond the jurisdiction of the common law. If a man falls from a boat or a ship in fresh water and is drowned, Blackstone explained, the vessel and cargo are in strictest of the law a Diodan. American jurist, and eventually, American Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. would argue that the Diodan traveled across the Atlantic from Britain via the common law, only to become foundational to U.S. admiralty law. So in his famous book, The Common Law, Holmes described Diodan as a medieval law that drew on metaphysics, on law's metaphysics, to enact the liability of inanimate things. Though the Diodan had been abolished for 35 years, uh, he noted its ongoing presence in American jurisprudence. For Holmes, the most striking example of the Diodan was the ship. The ship is the most living of inanimate things. Servants sometimes say she of a clock, but everyone gives a gender to vessels. And we need not be surprised to find a mode of dealing which has shown such extraordinary vitality in the criminal law applied with even more striking thoroughness in the admiralty. Also citing Gladstone's commentaries, Holmes reiterated that a ship on the high seas could not be considered diodan, but under admiralty law, a vessel was deemed a legal person, animated in much the same way as knives, horses, trains, and slaves. The legal personification of ships in American jurisprudence drew on the common law of diodan, and this is uh, Holmes' argument. So it is only by supposing the ship to have been treated as if endowed with personality, Holmes insisted, that the arbitrary seeming peculiarities of the maritime law can be made intelligible, and on that supposition, they at once become consistent and logical. 
For others on the U.S. Supreme Court, the legal personhood of ships was simply practical. It granted American jurists a necessary mechanism through which to extend the U.S. authority over ships and the seas, especially in a period of thriving maritime commerce and in a period of contest over transatlantic slavery. Ideas of personhood, including political, economic, and including its political, economic, and racial effects, were perhaps nowhere more evident than in the transatlantic slave trade. Just as the law could grant life to inanimate objects through legal personhood, it could also transform people into things. The laws of slavery were more concerned with protecting the rights of slave owners than they were with establishing the political and legal status of slaves. But questions of legal personhood emerged at two critical points when African captives were transported as cargo and when those enslaved were accused of committing crimes at, on land or at sea. Just as the British common law and British and US admiralty law distinguished the injuring thing or ship from its proprietor, the laws of slavery differentiated the offending slave from her owner. This was not an equivalent or parallel process. If the legal personhood of ships emerged from a maritime metaphysics when a hull touches the water, for example, the transformation of a slave from person to property followed a very different set of logics that authorized various forms and intensities of racial and gendered violence. Admiralty law and the laws of slavery transformed African captives first from humans to objects and then from commodities to legal persons. Whereas a ship's owner could be punished for the lawless actions of a slave through its arrest and forfeiture, a slave owner was compensated for the death of his supposedly guilty slaves. So the transformation of the figure of the slave from human to thing was neither dependent on metaphysics nor on abstraction alone. It demanded forms of racial and colonial violence. Regimes of terror began on the shores of West Africa, escalated during the Middle Passage, and extended from sea to plantation. For literary theorist Ian Balcom, turning humans into property required the violence of becoming a type, a type of person, or terribly not even that, a type of non-person, a type of property, a type of commodity, a type of money. The violence that made people into types demanded different registers of racial force that were directed at bodies and at minds alike. The violence of slavery I'm suggesting here was deeply entangled with the laws of the sea and the legal personhood of the ship. The transportation of, of unfree slaves on the free sea required regimes of racial coercion and violence that were made possible both on and by the moving ship. So, so far I, I briefly sketched the ship as legal actor by drawing links between transatlantic slavery, the legal personhood of the ship, through the law of Diodand and U.S. Admiralty Law. These connections are more fully developed in the book, but again, I'm happy to uh, talk more about this in the Q&A. What I'd like to do now is to turn to the Komagatamaru's 1914 voyage uh, and its Middle Passage. I use the term Middle Passage, um, which is almost exclusively, exclusively used in terms of transatlantic slavery, as a way of foregrounding the Komagatamaru's voyage at sea and as a way of highlighting the echoes of slavery in its trans-Pacific journey. So in July 1913, after owning the Sicilia for just over two decades, the Hamburg America Line sold the vessel to a small Japanese firm, Shinye Kisen Goshi Kaisha. The company owned one ship already, the Genzen Maru No. 3, and its newest acquisition would double their fleet, expand the company's trade, uh, and increase their profits. So together, the two ships crisscrossed the South China Sea, carrying Japanese coal to Southeast Asian ports, including Manila and Java. By the spring of 1914, Shinye Kisan began pursuing the possibility of transporting other cargoes, including Chinese indentures. They sent the Komagatamaru to Hong Kong with a Kobe shipping broker who was to obtain a passenger license for the, quote, China Coast Hooli trade. It was in Hong Kong that the firm's broker would encounter Gurdit Singh. In their meeting, Gurdit Singh expressed a keen interest in chartering a ship to transport Punjabi migrants to Vancouver. He had already been trying unsuccessfully for several months. But this time, the owners were intrigued by his proposal. Leasing the Komagatamaru to an Indian merchant seemed like a rewarding financial undertaking that potentially held fewer risks than transporting indentures on Chinese passenger ships and in accordance with increasingly restrictive British laws. 
This, as we know, was a tremendous miscalculation. Over the next seven months, the Komagatamaru would be at the center of a series of legal controversies that drew the attention of imperial and colonial authorities in Britain, India, Canada, South Africa, and also captured the interests of Indian anti-colonials across, across the globe. Although the ship never transported Indian, or sorry, Chinese indentures, the coolie trade remained vividly present in the 1914s voyage, a presence that recalled histories of transatlantic slavery. So the Kumagatamaru was leased to Worthit Singh for six calendar months, and the Charter Party established the new laws of the ship, including the vessel's permissible sea routes and the division of authority aboard. So the ship was only to be employed in strictly neutral trades and could only land at certain points of call that were all specified. The Charter Party granted Worthit Singh a full range of powers that surpassed the authority of even the ship's captain. Gwerthit Singh controlled the whole reach of the ship and held full authority over the captain and the crew. He just didn't have jurisdiction over their specific quarters. Originally from a small village in the Amritsar district of Punjab, Gwerthit Singh came to be known incorrectly as Bengal Ka Captain or Captain of Bengal. So Singh's newfound power came with clear responsibilities. According to the Charter Party, he was accountable for all charges and expenses arising through taking steerage passengers and was to supply all provisions in every respect and in accordance with the Hong Kong ordinances and to the satisfaction of the immigration officer. In return, Shinya Kisen assured the Komagatamu would be granted a Hong Kong passenger certificate for a full complement of steerage passengers and would be fitted with the necessary boats and rafts. As the ship awaited departure from Hong Kong, Singh consulted three lawyers and was advised that there were no restrictions upon the immigration by Indians from the colony unless they are under contract of service. So as the passengers claimed to be farmers and not indentured laborers, sorry, and, not in, and were not indentured laborers or laborers, the prohibitions did not apply to them. Following the ship's departure, there was no further discussion of uh, the passenger permits. So, so this is the one page, page 12 of the ship manifest, and uh, at the top it says farmers, and then uh, all the way down, ditto, ditto. Following the ship's departure, there was no further discussion of the passenger permits. However, there was considerable controversy surrounding the blue tickets that were issued by Gurdit Singh. So he writes, the committee found vouchers, sorry, the blue and white tickets. So he says, the committee found vouchers in my office. They tried in vain to prove that the past tickets were counterfeit ones by alleging that they were white. And these white tickets remained a matter of dispute during the voyage and thereafter. They authorized the landing of indentured Chinese and not the landing of uh, free Indians. And here's a copy of the, the ticket. When their broker was in Hong Kong, Shinya Kisen successfully secured a Chinese indenture permit under the Chinese Emigration Ordinance of 1889. Under the Act, a Chinese passenger ship included every ship carrying from any port in Hong Kong and every British ship carrying from any port in China or within 100 miles of the coast thereof, more than 20 passengers being natives of Asia. Under the Act, Asia didn't include India. The Act outlined in minute detail the regulations that were to be observed by captains of vessels transporting contract and free labor from Hong Kong and China. It established a requisite minimum standard to ensure the well-being of Chinese women and men and the seaworthiness of the ships that transported them. Chinese passenger ships and those were aboard were to be properly cared for, or captains would be subject to penalty, including imprisonment. The Hong Kong Ordinance made no specific reference to transatlantic slavery, yet the slave and the slave ship hovered throughout the Act. Like many laws surrounding indenture, the Ordinance was a legal and political response to the horrors of, transatlantic, of the transatlantic trade. Following the abolition of slavery, British authorities proposed indenture to be a new form of labor based on consent, free will, and contract. And my dear friend Radhika Mongia has written a wonderful book that came out with Duke in 2018. The ordinance foregrounded the legitimacy of consent through its repeated references to contract passengers as opposed to indentures. A clear message of the Hong Kong ordinance was that indenture was not slavery. On Chinese emigrant ships, ship decks were to be inspected for proper ventilation, shipmasters were required to hire doctors, and all vessels were to be fully operational 
with sufficient food and water. Ships without licenses and those, prohibited, uh, those with prohibited fittings could be seized, searched, and detained. Notwithstanding efforts to distinguish indenture from slavery, Indian and Chinese indentures and the coolie ships on which they traveled formed an indelible mark on the British Empire. Through the architecture of ships, their names, common sea routes, and conditions, including high rates of death and disease, indenture was, we might say, a repressed reminder of transatlantic slavery. On the outbound passage from Hong Kong, Worth Singh issued each passenger two tickets, a blue and a white one. The blue permits were class passenger tickets administered by the Guru Nanak Steamer Company, a company which Gurdit Singh initiated and which he planned to develop. So the Kamagatamaru's voyage was only supposed to be the, one, the first voyage of uh, uh, many more um, run by the Guru Nanak Steamer Company. The white tickets were issued under the eighth schedule of the Hong Kong Ordinance and were intended for the use of, in, of transporting indentured Chinese immigrants to Vancouver. So according to authorities, Gurdit Singh administered these, these tickets solely to defraud passengers. He convinced them that these passes were issued by the government and that uh, they authorized each recipient to enter Canada. Many, many of the passengers who received the white and blue tickets really believed that they would be permitted to land upon arrival. So Rala Singh said to authorities in, uh, after the ship arrived in Calcutta, we were given passes by the government under their signature and then we went. The white tickets which authorized the transport of Chinese contractors were interestingly marked with the names of Indian travelers. So this is uh, the one surviving ticket uh, which identifies Surgeon Singh. By issuing white vouchers to Kamagatamaru passengers, Gurdit Singh inadvertently transformed free Indian laborers into, in, into indentured and unfree Chinese. In so doing, he problematized the distinctions between freedom and unfreedom that figured so prominently in the abolition of slavery, in indentured labors, in, and in indentured labor, and in laws addressing so-called free migration. As the ship's journey would make clear, and as Singh would write later in his memoirs, Indians were not free. On the subcontinent, they remained firmly <coughs> under British control. In the colonies and dominions, they were subject to coercive legislation that denied them the mobility promised to white British subjects. Immigration laws were that Singh charged were a standing monument to the selfishness and color prejudice of Britain and her dominions. The racial coercion of British law, he continued, had long been established through transatlantic slavery. It, was, it set the violent foundations for indenture and later informed immigration prohibitions. And this is something that he writes about at length in his memoir. By issuing Chinese contract tickets to free Indians, Singh was tracing a continuous, though not a straight line, between slavery, indenture, and free migration, characterizing these as contemporaneous forms of racial legal violence that united Britain's empire in time and space. In drawing these connections, he challenged the dominant chronology of British law and history as marching steadily forward in a progressive and direct way. Echoes of slavery were also evident in the economies of the ship. So slavery, many scholars have argued, established the financial forum structures and institutions that were central to, lead to Atlantic commerce um, and to the emergence of the corporation as a legal person. Financial instruments, including bills of exchange, interest-bearing certificates, and maritime insurance facilitated the transfer of capital and commodities over long distances, while connecting disparate parts of the British Empire uh, and as well as the American Empire. Bills of exchange worked as new forms of paper currency, enabling merchants to purchase good for trade, goods for trade in West Africa to secure slaves and to export plantation commodities to Europe. Emerging out of slavery, transatlantic systems of credit were always already racial. Credit was embedded in what Ian Balcom calls a double economy of monetary value and an economy of trust, based on character. Bills of exchange enabled European men to lend money to other European men so that they could purchase captive Africans and as commodities. But of course, Gwyneth Singh was not a Liverpool merchant uh, or a London merchant. In the eyes of British, Canadian, and Indian authorities, he was an audacious colonial subject. The financial worlds that were foundational to thriving maritime economies were off limits to him. 
A system of credit, as Belcom reminds us, was more than just a set of accounting protocols. It demanded a phenomenology of transactions, promises, character, credibility, that did not extend beyond Europe and certainly not to an Indian populace thought to be corrupt and, man and mendacious. Gurdjit Singh was outlawed from the world of global capital, but this did not stop him. Well versed and experienced in the art of commerce, he assembled his own maritime economies and drew on European financial instrument, bills of exchange, and interest-bearing certificates through which he established shipboard systems of credit and debt. Um, and this is his interest-bearing certificate, and you can see that he was paying 24% uh, interest. Singh encountered many financial difficulties in chartering the Komodat Tamaru. Uh, so, for example, when the ship was docked in, uh, when the ship was stopped in Shanghai, uh, passengers and, inve and potential investors were prohibited from going to banks to withdraw money because the banks had all shut down. Um, and he had many other financial problems. As such, he borrowed money from at least 94 passengers. To document these transactions, he drew up an agreement signed by certain passengers which set the terms of their uh, arrangement. The sum of money was to be deposited on the 29th of April, 1914, for the purpose of defraying occasional expense incurred for necessary requirements and upkeep of the vessel, and the interest of which sum was to be paid to us, will be recovered by us from the Khalsa Devant Committee of Vancouver, who are trying their best for our welfare, the agreement read. In the event that the Khalsa Devant Society was unable to repay their loans, passengers could recover their money from Bai Gurdjit Singh, but they could not demand their deposits as long as Singh was on the vessel. Money would only be paid when the ship reached shore. The format of the agreement is as significant as what it contained. So Singh wrote this agreement, um, and his, uh, his uh, secretary and others helped write this agreement signed by certain passengers on a summary of freight lists, where he enumerated the names, villages, and districts of passengers, followed by signatures and thumb impressions. Ship manifests, including passenger freight lists, were critical to transoceanic commerce and to maritime law. They were especially vital to the slave and indenture trades, recording credits, debts, profits, and value. By the early 1800s, all ships crossing the the Atlantic were required by law to carry individual registries that identified the number of African captives aboard. In the interest of determining, determining the value of cargoes, manifests were to record the numbers of slaves um, and indentures on a ship. These, these inventories worked as modes of abstraction through which humans were transformed into cargo and property that could be valued more in death than in life. By listing passengers on summary of freight lists, Singh kept accounts of money lent and money owned, but he also conveyed the destitution and despair of passengers aboard the ship. So above the first summary of freight list on the left, on your left, uh, was a scribbled note addressed to the priest of Vancouver's Khalsa Devon Society. Written quickly and urgently in fragmented and disjointed prose, it said, please help us get off the ship. We are ready to do service for you. Please don't let us be sent back. Until we are able to pay you back, we will be at your mercy. Writing on freight lists with urgency and desperation and under the imminent threat of deportation, Gurdjit Singh once again pointed to the connected histories of transatlantic slavery, indenture, and so-called free migration. But he wasn't the only one. Echoes of transatlantic slavery also appeared in passenger appeals. So Amir Muhammad Khan, a leader of the Muslims and one of Gurdjit Singh's closest associates, wrote, the captain has refused to give us any lights. 370 passengers are confined in a dark prison house at night. We are treated very badly. We are treated as mere chattel. The conditions were deplorable, another passenger claim. Lights have been stopped, decks not washed, water stopped, steam for cooking, food stopped, seawater put into our provisions, sickness prevails, no doctor. The authorities have made us beggars, slaves, close prisoners in solitary confinement for an indefinite period in a steamship. As Daljit Singh, Gurdjit Singh's secretary, described it, the Ferengis treated us as inanimate objects which did not want food or water. And Ferengi is an Arabic term for foreigner used disparagingly to describe Britons and Europeans. Importantly for Gurdjit Singh, the passengers were not like slaves. By tracing connections between slavery, indenture, and Indian migration, 
He argued that the fate of those confined to the Komagatamaru was tied to the inhuman conditions that were brought through Britain's slave trade. Singh and the Komagatamaru passengers expressed their uh, condemnation of Dominion law and British rule through the language of transatlantic slavery, a language that had become legible and powerful from critiques, uh, uh, sorry, a legible and powerful form of critique through abolition. So to very quickly conclude, situating the Komagatamaru's uh, journey in maritime worlds reveals a very different history of the ship, one that recognizes the ship as an important legal actor and as, uh, uh, sorry, as an important legal actor. Um, and the voyage as a narrative that clearly exceeds the conventional themes of arrival, departure, nationalism, and territoriality. Focusing on the ship points to the continuities of legal and racial violence across geography and history. And perhaps more importantly, focusing on the ship through its multiple voyages across the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic Oceans, as it carried Europeans, Indians, and as it transported cargo, including cattle, coal, and later opium. Uh, these voyages suggest, of the Stephen Huck Cecilia, and especially the Komagatamaru, suggest that imperial and colonial histories are not linear, chronological, or sequential, but interconnected and overlapping. Histories of transatlantic slavery were not remnants of a bygone past, rather they formed a recurring presence evidenced in the legal form of the ship and in the vernaculars invoked by Gurdjit Singh and the other passengers, and in the maritime economies through which Singh sought to challenge the British Empire and its ongoing distribution of racial violence. Thank you. So we have a fair bit of time for questions. Um, and we can take a couple of minutes as you gather your thoughts. question and I feel like this book could actually be in my entire career uh, because I did not look at uh, these records. The records exist um, and so it would definitely be very productive to do so to even just to see how, I mean the ship was uh, um, retrofitted and adjusted and you know it was first uh, passenger cargo transporting livestock, and then it became passenger, and then it became just a cargo ship, and then Gurdjit Singh uh, made uh, you know, some improvements so that he could actually transport passengers again. Um, so there is a lot that one could say about, uh, uh, you know, about just the different ships themselves, and, or about the different versions of the same ship, uh, but I didn't do that. Uh, I didn't actually look at that, those records or do that work. I was really interested in, um, you know, in sort of rethinking the voyage of the Komagatamaru, and um, and part of it was really inspired by the fact that this was a Japanese ship chartered by a uh, um, uh, British Indian who had lived in Malaya and Singapore, um, and you know how we could appropriate this as just a Canadian story. That's actually exactly what I was going to ask you about. I really appreciate the, uh, you know, the, whatever, the wit, I guess, of the lens that you're using. Like many other people who teach um, Canadian history, I always, almost always, use 
this, this is like, you know, of the top 10 examples uh, when you're teaching undergrads that Canada has a complicated racial history, that multiculturalism is not the beginning or end, um, or even a very useful framework when we're thinking of the past, immigration restrictions. This is, this is such a good example. But it's a good, it's, it's, you're showing it's a really good example of all kinds of other things. I wonder if you could say more about what drew you, um, I don't want to say away from, but what, what expanded your lens to think about this in other than national terms, and does this change the national story that we, sh that we should be telling? So, um, initially this was going to be a different book. Uh, I was actually really interested in thinking about what the Komagatamaru meant in the context of India. Um, because at the time, like, I think I worked on this for nine years, and at the time that I sort of first started thinking about it, which was a very long time ago, um, you know, I was really sort of uh, struck by the fact that we knew so little about what this ship meant in the Indian uh, anti-colonial imaginary. Um, and so that's what uh, this book was intended to be. And then I started looking through shipping records, and I was really actually quite struck at um, how different the planet looked when you're mm -hmm. looking through shipping records, right? Um, and to sort of address your question about uh, about Canada and what this means. I mean, one of the really interesting things is how central uh, Canadian port cities become in this sort of 19th century uh, imaginary. So like even Vancouver, right? We have this kind of uh, national narrative of westward expansion. And you, if you're looking actually through shipping records, you see that actually this port city, the city of Vancouver was, or this, which became the city of Vancouver was really quite a significant place um, in terms of, not just in terms of migration, but also in terms of the movement of, um, res of natural resources and of tin fish and so on and so forth. So I think, um, I think it's important to uh, maintain the sort of national narrative, right, um, and not to forget what this actually meant in the consolidation of the nation as well. Mm -hmm. Like, this was the first ship to be turned back, um, so it had really serious mm -hmm. implications. Um, but I think it's also a way of connecting Canada to other sort of global forces that we may not necessarily think of when we're uh, looking at the nation from land and thinking about sort of westward expansion, um, that, you know, there are these other circulations happening that might give us a different uh, sense of how Canada figured or how different regions figured in a global economy, for example. Mm -hmm. Singing? Um, I'm really struck by the description of the two different the blue and white tickets, and obviously we can't, even with the journal, read it to for the same time, but my question is sort of about this negotiation between the three and the three once they actually arrive in Vancouver, and whether there is an intentional negotiation or use of this binary of three and three uh, in negotiating their arrival once they actually get there, or if this is kind of something that happens more with the passengers and heard it saying, and there's a different discussion once it's between the Canadian authorities. So, um, so can I, I'll just sort of make a mention about the tickets. So the tickets are, um, the blue tickets were ones that Gurdjit Singh was, like he really had a plan to start a shipping company. And the plan was that he would have a line that went from Bombay to Brazil, and then he called the other line Calcutta to Canada instead of Calcutta to Vancouver. Um, maybe for the alliteration. Um, but so this was part of like a much larger sort of business project and it was also aimed at reclaiming uh, Indian shipping which the British had basically uh, destroyed um, because of years of competition and so on and so forth and to maintain a monopoly um, on around the sea. Um, but my sense is that those white Chinese indenture tickets were actually probably already on the ship. So if the uh, firm had been negotiating with to, um, you know, to, and was successful in transporting Chinese indentures, then that might have been some of the residual paperwork that was left on board. And where that's saying, 
like he didn't read English, right? And very few of the passengers did. There was one passenger that he recruited to be on the ship because um, he could read English and speak English. And so it's hard to know sort of what these, you know, what these uh, promises were and what these different tickets were used for. Um, on the, I was just telling Ishita that I'm working, I uh, have been working on a, a paper that is looking at what's actually happening on the ship with the different passengers um, and particularly how the religious divides sort of play out, if at all. Um, and it's really interesting that the, the journey from Hong Kong to Vancouver is really uneventful. Like everybody's getting along, they have enough food. Um, and then it's when they get to Vancouver and they're detained and suddenly they're like, we're not allowed off the ship and, you know, that things really start to break down and they run short of provisions and that's the kind of tipping point. Um, and, the, and that's when there are these sort of uh, divisions where some are saying that, well, Rudit Singh didn't know or, and others are saying, no, he deliberately tricked us. Um, but with the uh, BC Court of Appeal, the argument made by the lawyers in the case um, certainly is about, uh, you know, that these are, are British subjects, that they're free migrants, that they have, they should be entitled to land, um, and also that they are already in British Columbia because they're docked in Vancouver Harbor, um, and they should be extended the same kinds of civil liberties that are extended to people living in British Columbia. So there are sort of multiple arguments being made um, uh, and different sort of legal regimes being invoked, right? So uh, um, including the Charter Party where Gurdjieff Singh is saying, well, according to the Charter Party, I should be allowed to go off uh, the ship to get provisions because that's my responsibility. And he's, of course, not allowed. Um, it's, um, I really enjoyed your talk, um, and I really enjoyed the book too. <laughs> um, so I, I'm really interested in um, Gurditsa himself and sort of how he's sort of implicated in like his mobility and like is, is implicated also in other sort of circuits of empire and like the expansion of sort of British control and rule and through the shipping lines and through like I mean his he was a planter in Malaya he said um, so. And then also like the fact that okay he's engaging in these sort of colonial enterprises himself of sort of traversing the Pacific and creating new shipping lines which again like are meant to again help settle British Columbia too with, with settlers, whatever color they might be. So I think I'm just wondering if um, if you could maybe I guess elaborate or speak a bit more about yes, like I guess we're um, how do I bring this? I'm sorry. Um, like I guess the li like not limits of his own anti-colonialism, but is like I and I understand that you've also said okay, maybe this is more of like a spectrum, but how does that kind of fit in? Like when when we call him anti-colonial, um, but also the fact that he's implicated in all these sort of colonial circuits that are meant to sort of expand empire. Um, I was just wondering maybe how we think that through. I think that's such a great question, and it's such an important question. And you know, one of the arguments that I make in the chapter on indigeneity is that we can't think about anti-colonialism as anti-racism, right? That uh, the two are not necessarily the same thing. Um, but I think it's really important to, I mean, we could also draw on other examples of anti-colonial figures that we've really sort of, uh, um, you know, celebrated, uh, like Gandhi, for example, and his time in South Africa really demonstrates that as well. But I think, um, I mean, I think it's so easy to just say, well, this person is like really awful because, you know, they were, uh, he was a planter and, um, you know, on and on and on, or that he was trying to bring, uh, you know, migrants, Indian migrants to uh, places that they didn't belong. But I think it's also really important to think about colonialism and racism as forms of power, right, that were also embedded in and implicated by uh, and produced by. Um, and so I think it's important to remember that we can't actually sort of extract ourselves, let alone historical figures, from the conditions in which they're operating. 
So in the context of Malaya, he was, uh, um, he actually was, he had a, um, I just found his uh, land records, so I'm really excited, um, uh, when I was in Kuala Lumpur, but he, um, uh, he had a coconut plantation, and many of the small scale plantation owners also uh, planted rubber, and I have no, um, idea at this point of who was employed or how many people, but I do have sort of uh, accounts from Europeans who are traveling in that area and looking into the sort of uh, rubber boom that, you know, the small scale holdings, the native holdings were like the worst uh, in terms of their treatment of uh, laborers and also in their conditions, right? Um, and you know, his plan for transporting uh, or for these uh, shipping lines was to transport Indian commodities um, and also to transport Indian labor, but not necessarily permanently. So he was really of the view that everyone should leave India, that it would actually create uh, and come back, right? So it would create a kind of a political awakening that, uh, that people didn't seem to have if they just stayed in one place. Um, but, you know, there's no question that he and the uh, passengers also, I mean, many of them were writing to authorities saying, you know, um, colonization is not just a Canadian project or a project for white Britons, that uh, Indians are also uh, involved and would be happy to participate. Um, and I think, you know, we need to sort of think about some of this as strategic, that, you know, in their last opportunities, these are the kinds of things that they're writing. Um, but I also think that we need to remember that uh, that many of these people were also implicated in violence and dispossession within India itself. So, so I don't, I, I love where that's saying, and he's one of the sort of continuous figures in my next project, Enemies of Empire. Um, but, you know, I, I try really hard in the book not to vilify him or to, you know, um, idolize him, even though I see Billy Green. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the beginning of the presentation, first of all, thank you, it was really interesting. Um, you mentioned that of the 370 passengers, I think 20 were allowed. What was the basis for that? And was it like a legal difference? Yeah, so those 20 were, so the, the records vary. It's like 20, 21, 22. Um, but these 20 passengers were ones who were able to prove previous domicile in Canada. So the continuous journey provision didn't apply to people who had already arrived in Canada and then left and come back. Yeah. Thank you for a really fascinating talk. Uh, I haven't read your book yet, but I feel like it when I read it, it'll deepen my understanding of what Lisa Lowe calls the intimacy of four continents. Um, so uh, I wanted to ask a question about the view then. Uh, and I, my only sort of familiarity with that concept comes through Colin Diane's work on the view then, the, the criminalized agency of the slave. Yeah. But I was fascinated by this way that the view then kind of uh, applies very differently to a ship. And so is there, and then thinking about that in relation to the gendering of the ship as feminine, is there something going on there with the, the way that the agency of the ship is understood legally and the way that the ship is gendered? Or is there, is that just kind of no, two different stories? No, it's, to, it's the same, it's absolutely the same story. So, <laughs> I was saying that I hope somebody asks me about this because I'm trying to, I promise something to someone, uh, a paper on legal personhood, which I'm just working on, like I'm just struggling through now. And um, part of it is uh, trying to sort of explore these linkages, right? So I think with, uh, so Colin Diane's work is amazing. Um, and I think what she's really pointing to and identifying is the, this idea of negative personhood, right? And how this becomes um, uh, a personhood that's ascribed to enslaved people, to prisoners, to people that she describes as civilly dead, right? Um, but I think in the same way that the law 
uh, imposes this kind of negative personhood. There are examples, including the Diodand and uh, the legal personality of the ship, where we see this kind of positive uh, personhood uh, ascribed to different entities or the corporation. Um, and so what I'm really interested in is uh, the fact that, you know, from sort of 1800 to the early, to 1902, the U.S. Supreme Court is deciding these cases around the legal status of ships and really um, ascribing legal personality to them, probably most explicitly in this 1902 case that I mentioned in my talk. Um, but at the same time, those same judges, right, so uh, Chief Justice uh, Marshall, and story are also deciding on the legal status of slaves. And so part of this paper is to think about these connections that we can't just separate the sort of legal and positive personhood that uh, the law produces. <coughs> we need to think about them as deeply entangled. And what's interesting also is that um, uh, you know, people who, I'm thinking of uh, Marlene Nervis Phillips' book on the Zong, people who have written about the Zong are talking, or Horton Spillers, you know, are talking about how ungendering is a really sort of uh, vital part in how the slave becomes a commodity or property. And so at the same time that this is happening, we have like these, all of these, uh, you know, seafarers and literary, <coughs> writers like Conrad, for example, um, and the U.S. Supreme Court also like ascribing gender to ships. And so there's like a really interesting dynamic that's not um, sort of parallel, <coughs> but still connected and overlapping. I'm going to sneak in a question which I think you started answering very clearly already in response to the previous question. Um, and I and it's about, um, I mean, we read your book and it became even clearer, I think, to see some of your materials up on screen there, uh, to think about how um, this, the history of this particular journey is haunted by, right, in its, in its sort of archival forms as well as anything else with the history of Atlantic slavery. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, what's at stake in terms of <coughs> theory, in terms of method, in terms of historiography, to make the Atlantic a part of the story uh, in a way that you do, even though technically if we just follow the biography of the ship, the Atlantic really emerges as uh, something that's haunting this journey more than sort of um, anything else. You might not, not like what I have to say, given that this is a history department. <laughs> um, but you know, I think um, so. When I first started working, and I so when I first started working on this project, and especially when I was sitting in the Guildhall Library, like plotting all these voyages of these different vessels, um, uh, of this well, these different vessels, the same vessel but different names. I was actually struck by how interconnected these different ocean regions are, right? Um, and so part of what I was thinking about when I was thinking of, you know, what does it mean to think with the ocean? Uh, what does it mean to make the ocean a method? Um, was about moving away from metaphoricity, right? That it's not about metaphor, even though metaphor is so important. But there is a certain kind of materiality um, that one can link through the technology, through the roots, through the law. Um, that I wanted to sort of bring to the foreground. Um, and then it was also an attempt to move away from the kind of area studies model that has really dominated in ocean studies and maritime history. Um, so, you know, uh, and I know that some people, by including the Atlantic, the argument has been that um, or some people have said to me, well, maybe you're, you know, just sort of repositioning the Atlantic as the dominant frame, and that's actually not what I'm trying to do at all. It's an attempt to bring these different ocean regions into a conversation with one another, um, and what can we learn from their shared histories, right? And what is at stake in sort of dissolving these, um, uh, these sort of fields as Atlantic, Indian, and Pacific Ocean Studies. Um, and, you know, I realize that this is a super ambitious um, 
invitation, um, and it's not something that anyone can do in a single project, but it might be actually a, a more like a collective project of trying to think about, as many people have done in different ways, um, you know, uh, really a kind of global uh, history. Um, and then in terms of, uh, I mean, I think, so there is this uh, geographical aspect uh, that I'm writing against, but then also, I mean, I think um, in especially reading Gurdjieff Singh's writings, like it was clear to me that he wasn't actually abiding by the kinds of periodizations that we impose on, you know, this is like antebellum history, or this is like British imperial history, or this is, you know, Canadian history, that in fact he's really disrupting the way we're thinking about time and, um, and historiography, right? And so part of what interests me is like what happens when we mess this up when we stop thinking about history as something linear that we can sort of, where we can sort of plot um, uh, chronicle events and think about the ways in which they're based on these sort of shared, uh, these echoes, whatever they are. And for me, one of the ways of tracing that has been through legal forms, mm -hmm. right? Because there are only a finite number of, uh, you know, legal techniques and strategies. And so what's really interesting is to see how they get adapted and moved around to deal with different populations. I like that answer very much. What you <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you mentioned this uh, temporality and, and, and the use of space um, that is in the book. And I would like to ask you about longitude, you know, and you're really being kind of put in the talk. But in thinking about that divide between land and sea, you really show us how important the development of longitude was for this kind of ocean current world and laws that come after that. I'm curious how we can maybe think with longitude then from the sea back onto the land and ask, you know, this form of measurement that really does encircle the globe is such a problem and that you try to really become some sort of legal regime in itself. Then it becomes a really big issue on land too. So I guess what I'm asking is this land sea divide, does it kind of fall away when you start thinking about these about measurements about law in that kind of sense? And, and if so, is that you know, the way you think that this project could develop in these subsequent things that you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, um, the, I think the distinction between land and sea becomes really sort of murky. Um, and what I think is really interesting is the way in which maritime laws often get applied to land, um, or terrestrial laws get applied to the sea. Um, so one of the things that I found really interesting was to think about how um, laws around absconding sailors, for example, inform some of the laws around uh, fugitive slaves. Um, or uh, I, I, had a, I wrote a paper about um, the Torrens Land Registry System, which was actually, um, uh, Torrens was a um, customs agent, and he actually, you know, uses this, or develops this land registry system from the ship registry, um, and then how that becomes used on, on land, first in South Australia, and then also in many port cities that are under uh, British jurisdiction, including British Columbia, um, as a way of, uh, sort of commodifying and um, uh, you know erasing the previous owners, erasing indigenous people, and creating land as something that could now be sort of parcelled and sold. Um, so I think there's definitely you know a circulation that is happening between land and sea. Um, we can see, we can you know, there are many places I think that one can can find those circulations for sure. We do have time for a last question, if there is one. Adam? Thanks so much. Um, I don't know much about this period, so it may not be a very useful question, but one of the things when you were mentioning about the anti-colonial kind of dimensions of uh, this figure and you know what this voyage uh, brought out, it reminded me that I think that you know, um, the Ghadar party, um, you know, in the Indian diaspora in not only British colonies but also the U.S. and <coughs> so on, were you know active in all 
also involved in some part in this in this ship's story. And so I just wondered, I was thinking about um, what do you see as the intersections between what you've emphasized in terms of the commercial and maritime interconnections of sort of the empire um, and the political networks and you know uh, that were created by these diasporic communities. And I guess I was thinking about that because you mentioned that you started off with an interest in its effect on India. And I imagine perhaps maybe this was the line you were following. So I'm wondering where that story kind of ended up in this in terms of these intersecting communities. So so thank you. That's a, a great question. And I mean, I think there there's definitely overlaps and uh, uh, between the gathers and uh, the passengers, both in terms of uh, you know uh, associations and uh, political networks. There were allegations that there were many uh, gather documents and pamphlets that were retrieved from the ship when it arrived in Calcutta. Um, but Gurdjieff Singh was a very was very clear that he was not a Gutherite and he wasn't actually affiliated with the Gathers at all, even though he's routinely um, identified as a Gutherite. And you know, he really saw himself at, or described himself as um, someone who followed Gandhi much more than he followed the Gathers. And he was also very committed to this. He was very committed to. Um, to the idea of law and legality. And you know, in his memoirs, he writes about the fact that what happened to the Komodataru um, and to the passengers at Budge Budge had less to do with uh, the sort of um, essence of law than it did with the poor application and enforcement of it. Um, so there is something really distinct about how he's thinking about, uh, you know, revolution and uh, independence and insurgency. And um, and I think partly, to get back to your question, I think partly because he's such a complicated figure um, and he himself is problematizing what anti-colonialism is and saying, well, you know, I follow this line much more than I do the other. Um, so, you know, part of what I was hoping to do if I had written the first book was to really kind of try to pluralize how we think about anti-colonialism in the Indian context because it isn't just Gandhi and it isn't just the others. There are, um, you know, these sort of minor figures that are also coming up with uh, their own strategies that are uh, drawn on sort of previous um, histories of, uh, of merchant capitalism or of shipping. Thank you. So if there are no further questions, um, thank you very much for that wonderful talk. And um, thank you for coming. And I know this was the last stop, or not, or a stop in various stops that you've made um, just this year, talking about your book. And thanks again for joining us.